And we'll now have, we'll now have the first response by Dr. Ayala. Um, when the slides change, good. They're very efficient people back there. Thank you. Um, so, design by natural selection. The previous uh, topic was evolution by natural selection. So, Darwin was able to explain how design comes about by natural selection in um, as I said before, nine of the 14 chapters, and this theory has advanced enormously, and it's obviously not something that I can show you here, all these thousands of pieces of evidence, and all thousands of works and theoretical work in a single lecture. But let me review for a moment his theory. He says, as more individuals are produced that can possibly survive, can it be thought improbable seeing that variations useful to man have undoubtedly occurred. He's referring to the first chapter of the book, where he tells the experience of farmers and animal breeders, where they take variations which are hereditary, which occur in organisms, and utilize them for our own benefit, for human benefit, to have a wheat which has more grain, or cows that produce more milk, or chicken that uh, lay more eggs. The point here is only demonstrating that hereditary variations occur. He's not arguing anything else other than that in the first chapter. So he says, thinking, seeing that these variations have occurred useful to us, can be thought improbable that other variations useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life should sometimes occur in the course of thousands of generations. If such do occur, this is what we saw already earlier, can we doubt that individuals having any advantage, however slight over others, would have the best chance of surviving and procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. In fairness to Darwin, I should let you know that Darwin didn't write that with a Spanish accent. <laughs> I did that for color. So here is the kind of example that I would like to show to you, to you a little bit to show how mutation and natural selection interplay. Uh, this particular experiment, the, the slide suits, seems very imposing and difficult. It is, and I will explain it. But I like this experiment because it's the kind of experiment that we were doing in 1961 when I came to this country as a student at Columbia University. We are trying to do a number of things. One is how natural selection will work with microorganisms, and also we are trying to estimate rates of mutation. This was a time when what now is called molecular biology did not exist, so this was done in courses which were known as bacteriology. So this experiment is very simple. One uses a test tube, a small test tube, capacity 10 cc or 10 milliliters, to grow bacteria. Now, bacteria, in order to grow, all what they need is a source of energy, sugar. So all what one needs is to have a, a sugar solution in water to introduce bacteria for them to grow. They are able to synthesize all their biological components, all their organic components. We are not. They, for example, can synthesize the 20 amino acids they make all proteins, we are only able to synthesize half of them. We have lost over evolutionary time the other half, so we have to eat protein because we are not able to synthesize. Bacteria are able to synthesize all the components, so one does not need to give them food. Just a source of energy is sugar. Now, the bacteria that we, we are using in this experiment is E. coli, is the common bacterial of the human colon, which uh, meant that if something goes to the Wrong, something goes wrong with the experiment, 
uh, you don't get sick. Um, so these bacteria, however, have a mutation that make them unable to synthesize one of the amino acids, histidine. So one has to put histidine in the medium also. They also are sensitive to streptomycin, an antibiotic, as all bacteria that have not been exposed to an antibiotic are. So one introduces a few bacteria in this uh, water solution of sugar with histidine, and in a couple of days, less typically, depending on the temperature, uh, about 20 billion bacteria will be produced there. Then the next step of the experiment is a drop of streptomycin and an antibiotic kills the bacteria. Well, it does not kill them all, because independently of whether the, um, the antibiotic is there or not, spontaneous mutations occur that it, it make it resistant to streptomycin with a frequency of one in a hundred million. So we expect among the 20 billion, some 200 bacteria to survive. And a couple of days later, you have 20 billion bacteria. Now we move the bacteria, this, where the experiment we were doing, to a culture where there is no histidine, there is no the amino acid, and the bacteria die. As we would die, we would not be fed the proper amino acids. But not all, because the probability of mutation from not being able to synthesize histidine to being able to synthesize it occurs with four in a hundred million. So about a hundred bacteria survive, and two days later you have 20 bacteria all of them having the two attributes which have been independently established. I have established the ind independent. And moreover, it's an extremely improbable event, the two requirements of density are met, four times, four times 10 to the minus 16, that is four divided by one followed by 16 zeros in four days. Well, let me give you some examples of nature, uh, some simple examples of nature of how natural selection works. And the first example is the one of Bistom betularia, the peppered moth that uh, Professor Craig has alluded to. Here you have the wild, typical peppered moth standing on a tree in a wet forest in England, which is covered by lichens, and as you see, it is very well covered cryptically because it's much in the background. Mutations occur spontaneously with frequency of about um, the order of typical mutations, actually higher than, than the ones in the bacteria, uh, to the melanic form. Whenever a melanic form up, mute, it appears in the, under these conditions, they are eaten readily. This, uh, the main predator of these moths are birds who see very much the way we see. So obviously we see this, and they will eat it. So up to 1850, no dark bacteria, not melanic, I'm um, sorry, not melanic moths have been found in collections of uh, England, but then they start to appear and start to increase in frequency more and more. What has happened? The Industrial Revolution. Contamination, uh, soot had killed the lichens and have given a cover to the trees like this, and under those conditions, the dark moth is not readily visible. The common moth is, so these are common, common moth, eaten more often, and so things uh, start to change. The black moths increase in frequency. In the 1960s, the Britain, in Britain, some uh, strict laws are passed against using coal in factories, and the situation reverses again. So evolution is reversible in response to natural selection. Now, one of the best places to study evolution by natural selection is in archipelagos, which are very isolated uh, from the nearest continents. Uh, no archipelago is more isolated than the Hawaiian Islands, 2,000 miles away from where I live. Now, the Hawaiian Islands are all formed here, where the Kilauea volcano is active right now, and then there is something else that is happening, and is that they are sitting on a plate tectonic, the Pacific plate tectonic, so they are moving northwesterly as they are being formed, and there is some time when there is no eruptions, so you have a new island being formed, if 
some time passes but not too much, you have several mountains and you have uh, in this um, in, in the big island. So you look at the kinds of organisms of in Hawaii and what happens? There are no mammals. There are all sorts of organisms that are absent because they never made it the 2,000 miles from the continent. It's in the continents where most of the evolution occurs. Yet you have a few organisms like, like Drosophila of which 500 species occur there, and they are more diversified there in the kinds of foods that they eat, the ways they mate, the ways they live, than the rest of the world together. The area of Hawaii is about, what, 25%, the area of Indiana, 25% of all the species of the 2,000 species that exist in the world exist there. Uh, Darwin was not lucky enough to be in, um, to be in Hawaii, but he visited the Galapagos Islands. Galapagos is the Spanish word for um, tortoise, these huge land turtles which weigh as adults 300 pounds and more, which he found that they were diversifying each island because they were isolated as a consequence of natural selection adapting them to the local conditions to the extent that the Spanish sailors could tell Darwin from which island a particular tortoise came just by looking at it, and then Darwin studied the evolution there of other organisms, particularly finches. There is only one species in Western uh, South America. Uh, the Galapagos are about 600 miles away from South America. And here you have all these species from very tiny ones to very large ones with different kinds of beaks. So now let me use the last minute that I think I have uh, to uh, consider a little bit the, the argument of irre irreducible complexity presented, for example, by Behe. Uh, unless you have all the parts of the eye, or all the parts of the bacterial flagellum, or all the parts of the um, blood clotting system, it doesn't function. So he says natural selection cannot work because you have all the parts at the same time. Well, for, the, for all the examples that he gave in his previous book has been shown in detail how the evolution occurred and I'm going to show you with respect to the eye uh, he says that unless as uh, Paley said that Paley said it before natural selection was known before Darwin then he knows about natural selection so that's why he says it cannot happen a little but one step at a time this is the eye of mollusk known as a limpet. We don't need to study fossils to know the evolution of the eye. We can look to living, look and look at living mollusks because they are a very diversified group of organisms for which, for some of which the environment has not changed. So they don't need to evolve. These are small mollusks about the size of my, uh, the, uh, big, uh, big finger, uh, um, my thumb. Uh, nail, which are conical, and they live in the intertidal, and all what they need uh, is to know whether there is light or not, because if there is light, the tide is down, and then they can go around grazing, if it is there, the tide is in, and they attach themselves, you can try to grab them, you cannot move them, because they don't want to be moved by the tide, because otherwise they will die. Well, here you have another mollusk, which not only can see whether there is light or not, that also can detect movement. Then you have another one with a little more complicated retina, retina, a little more complicated nervous system, kind of an opening, so you can see the, the direction of light as well as movement. And then you have another one, and another one, finally the, 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 the um, octopus or the squid which are also mollusks, which have an eye like ours, a camera eye as complex as ours, but they don't have the effect that we do. You remember we have a blind spot because the nerve, the optical nerve has to cross the retina to go to the brain. They don't have to do that because the nerve forms outside. So if uh, I were to be a defender of intelligent design, I would have to argue that somehow God loves octopuses and squids more, more than he loves humans, which I don't find it very comfortable. <laughs>
We'll now have the first response by Dr. Craig. Okay. You'll recall that I concluded my opening speech by asking the question, what is the evidence for Professor Ayala's extraordinary extrapolation? Before we look at the evidence, I think it's worth emphasizing just how extraordinary an extrapolation it is. Many of us probably think that if random mutation and natural selection can explain, for example, the evolution of the horse, then that surely shows the power of the Darwinian mechanisms. In fact, evolution within a single kind like this is nothing compared to the vast range of life. You might think, well, if we could show that random mutation and natural selection could explain, say, how a bat and a whale evolved from a common ancestor, wow, that would really show the power of these mechanisms. Sorry, think again. Slide 33 shows the major groups or phyla of the animal kingdom. Notice that a bat and a whale are both mammals, which is just one of the subcategories under the chordates. Even the evolution of a bat and a whale from a common ancestor is an utter triviality compared to the vast range of the animal kingdom. It would do nothing to explain, for example, how a bat and a sea urchin evolved from a common ancestor, not to speak of a bat and a sponge. This represents an extrapolation of gargantuan proportions. Indeed, it represents an enormous leap of faith in the efficacy of the Darwinian mechanisms. Now, if this extrapolation takes your breath away, get a load of this. Slide 34, please. The whole previous slide you just looked at is contained on the little twig of the right-hand branch labeled animals. I love the modesty of that label, animals. The whole of the animal kingdom is contained in that little twig. And notice the twig to the right of it, plants, plants. The whole of the plant kingdom is contained in that twig. And these are just two twigs on the branch of eukaryotes. There's still the two other domains of the bacteria and the archaea to be accounted for. The extrapolation of the Darwinian mechanisms from peppered moths and fruit flies and finch beaks to the production and evolution of every living thing is a breathtaking extrapolation of gargantuan, Bobdignagian proportions. So again, I think we are compelled to ask, what is the evidence for this extraordinary extrapolation? Well, in his last speech, Dr. Ayala discussed some of the evidence for natural selection. He simply reiterated the evidence concerning breeding. But as I already explained, the experiments with breeders actually show the limits of breeding. For example, despite decades of effort, uh, breeders have never been able to get chickens to lay more than one egg a day. Breeding actually shows the limits of what natural selection and mutation can do. As for the peppered moths, he didn't respond to the point that no change in the moths occurred at all. There was no evolution in, in, in moths. He then talks about E. coli uh, and the development of drug resistance, but this completely failed to respond to the argument that I gave that drug resistance is easy for bacteria to develop a resistance to because it requires only simple single point mutations. By contrast, the malarial bacterium has never been able to overcome sickle hemoglobin because it would require multiple mutations or a sequence of mutations occurring blindly and this is just too improbable. He refers to work on the bacterium E. coli. However, I want to point out that just last month in Nature, uh, Richard Linsky and his colleagues published uh, the results of their research on 40,000 generations of E. coli grown in the laboratory. And what they discovered is that while there were a couple score of beneficial mutations that occurred in these E. coli bacteria, nevertheless, these were uh, degradative in nature, degenerative in nature. That is, they involved the loss of genetic information or the loss of protein function. There's no indication that these uh, bacteria were on their way to building new complex systems. 
so that Lenski's work lines up very well exactly with what ID predicts. In a huge number of tries, one sees minor changes, mostly degradative, but no new complex systems evolve. And Lenski's work gives again tangible evidence of what Darwin, uh, Darwinism can do, rather than leaving us to debate speculative scenarios. Malaria, HIV, and E. coli represent three fundamentally different forms of life, a eukaryote, a virus, and a prokaryote. And in each case, the evidence for the efficacy of the Darwinian mechanisms is the same. It doesn't do very much. I quote from Michael Behe's blog online, instead of imagining what the power of random mutation and selection might do, we can look at the examples of what it has done. And when we look at the best, clearest examples, the results are, to say the least, quite modest. Time and again, we see that random mutations are incoherent and much more likely to degrade a genome than to add to it. And these are the positively selected beneficial random mutations. He says there is no evidence that Darwinian processes can take the multiple coherent steps needed to build new molecular machinery that fills the cell. So I simply ask again, what is the evidence for this extraordinary extrapolation that the Darwinian makes? Well, Dr. Ayala says there is speciation that occurs in fruit flies in Hawaii. Yes, and this is well within the limits of what the Darwinian mechanisms can achieve. This is probably due to genetic drift of the flies among the islands. He appeals to finch beaks on the Galapagos Islands of different sizes. But like the peppered moths, nothing really evolved here. It's just that the proportion of finches with large beaks increased during the dry season or the drought, and the proportion with small beaks decreased. Once the rains came again, the normal beak proportions returned among the population of finches there. He argues against Michael Behe on the evolution of the eye. But what struck me about this is so odd is that if you read Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe, on pages 37 and 38 of Darwin's Black Box, Behe says that the eye is not irreducibly complex, and therefore this is not one of the examples to which he will appeal in his book. He says the muscles that focus the lens or turn the eye function as a contraction apparatus, which can be applied to many different systems. The perception of light by the retina is not dependent on them. Tear ducts and eyelids are also complex systems, but separable from the function of the retina, and so on and so forth. So you will find nowhere in Darwin's black box Michael Behe appealing to the eye as an irreducibly complex system. On the contrary, he says it's a system of systems. And so this simply doesn't engage ID theory responsibly. I indeed, I find this, quite frankly, to be very typical of the critics of ID. They don't engage these theorists responsibly and in detail. Rather, they offer easy, dismissive reputations that doesn't really take their work seriously. So it seems to me that when I look at the evidence as an objective observer, it seems to me that I haven't been shown any good reason to think that the Darwinian mechanisms are sufficient to explain that extraordinary diversity of life that we see uh, on this planet during the time available. And if we could have slide 17, in their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, physicists John Barrow and Frank Tipler list ten steps in the course of human evolution, each of which, each of which is so improbable that before it would occur, the sun would cease to be a main sequence star and would incinerate the earth. These include things like the development of a DNA-based genetic code, if we could have that up there, please. Do we have that slide? I guess not. All right, well, it includes things like the DNA-based genetic code, the evolution of aerobic respiration, evolution of glucose fermentation to pyruvic acid, the development of an endoskeleton, and so on and so forth. Ten steps in the course of the evolution of Homo sapiens, each of which is so improbable that before it would happen, the sun would go through its stellar evolution and incinerate the earth. As a result, they report, and I quote, there has developed a general consensus among evolutionists that the evolution of intelligent life comparable in information processing ability to that of Homo sapiens is so improbable 
that it is unlikely to have occurred on any other planet in the entire visible universe. But that raises the question, and why think that it has evolved on this planet by these Darwinian mechanisms? Indeed, doesn't the evidence suggest just the opposite? In fact, Tipler himself now believes that the evolutionary process must have been guided. So the question remains, how can Professor Ayala maintain in light of the evidence that ID is not even viable? Notice that tonight I'm not arguing for the truth of ID. I'm agnostic about that. I don't know if ID is, uh, is justified in the field of biology. But what I haven't seen is good evidence to think that it's not even viable. And it seems to me that this remains an alternative that deserves a place at the table. So why think that ID is not viable? Well, that takes us to Professor Ayala's theological objections to intelligent design. In the absence of good scientific evidence for the adequacy of the Darwinian mechanisms, the critic of ID has to resort to theological objections. But as I explained in my first speech, these are simply irrelevant to the scientific design inference because that inference says nothing about the moral qualities of the designer nor about the uh, designer being all-powerful. So that these questions, though interesting and important for theology, are not relevant in tonight's debate in assessing the viability of intelligent design. I hope to address that theological question on my website uh, this coming week, since I haven't had time to discuss, discuss it in tonight's debate. But for now, I think we can conclude that absent scientific evidence for the adequacy of the Darwinian mechanisms to explain the vast display of life on this planet in so relatively short a time, intelligent design remains a viable player in the field of biology.